Hey, everybody. Welcome to the brand new rollback format of the Rich Roll podcast, where we share the best episodes from our audio-only catalog with all of you guys. Currently, almost 300 incredible evergreen conversations are nowhere to be found on YouTube. And so to begin to remedy this misfortune, we bring you my gravelly voiced brother from another mother, the bon vivant at large known as Mishka Shupali. Mishka is a dear friend and has been on the podcast many, many times. He's a writer and musician who pens true stories about drink, drugs, disasters, desire, deception, and their aftermath. He is also the author of The Long Run, which is a mini memoir detailing his transformation from alcoholic drug abuser to sober ultra runner. And it's also the work that brought us together initially for our very first podcast, which was one of my personal favorite episodes. So let's roll around in the mud with my brother, Mishka Shibali. Enjoy. I didn't know it was possible to live in New York City and, and be that far away from a subway station <laughs> as I'm like lugging 50 pounds of recording equipment with me from over here. I, I didn't realize you were bringing as, you know, as much stuff as you brought. I would have. Uh, uh, there's probably a much easier way to do this. Well, th- this is the problem, though, when you run, you know, five Ironmans in under a week is that it uh, no nobody's will nobody's willing to come and pick you up yeah, and where give was, you a ride. Where was my town car, man? <laughs> pick know. me up in Manhattan to shuttle me out here. To the, <laughs> I, know, I know. I've actually spent uh, we're here in Greenpoint, uh, Brooklyn. And on this visit to New York, I've spent more time in Brooklyn uh, in the past couple of days than I think I have combined in you know the last several years of coming to new york or actually even when i lived here which i think is a testament to how new york is changing yeah the i mean the only people who haven't been priced out of manhattan at this point are uh the fashion people the wall streeters and the coke dealers (laughs) (laughs) and like because you know cocaine is the everything you know know, it's what keeps you know those other industries running of course but um but yeah i mean and in you know and in five years like I'll be in Philly because I won't be able to afford to live here. Yeah, I was in um, Dumbo this morning. And uh, I mean, that is just, it's such a cool neighborhood, but you can see what it's going to be like. And I mean, it's the next Tribeca, you know, it's, it's, it's gentrifying quickly over there. Yeah. I, I used to uh, train at a boxing gym down there and it was, you know, it was awesome. Cause it was, you know, sort of like the old guard. And uh, you know, I got to spar with a guy who fought Tyson and, um, you know, and, and, and now, I mean, I'm sure that gym is there, but it's, um, you know, it will have been transformed or it's, or it's turned into a graphic design business or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. A new startup. Yep. Um, it is cool down there. And I thought, Oh, I'm in, you know, I'm in Dumbo and I'm going to, I'm going to go over and see Mishka. I'll just jump a subway. And I had to actually, the only way here was to go back into Manhattan on the subway and then loop around. Yeah, yeah. And then I walk twenty blocks. <laughs> <laughs> You're remote, dude. It's I, I like to think that this is the last dying breath of of uh, of Greenpoint. You know, there's I have like the sewage treatment plant behind me, like the cemetery on one side. This is the last outpost of humanity. It's it's authentic Queens. though. What it, it's like a Polish neighborhood, right? I mean, that was sort of what I was getting walking through. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Here. It's pretty much a straight uh, Polish hood. Yeah, and it it looks like it's relatively unchanged from probably what it looked like, you know, twenty twenty five years ago. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these people have been here for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I've been here. How long have you lived in this apartment? It'll be seven years um, that I've lived here, and that's the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my life. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, actually, I used to live here with. Uh, I, I found the place on Craigslist and the guy I lived with was this like horrible blackout alcoholic and perfect, I, perfect. <laughs> coming from me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, like that. I wasn't the worst drunk who lived here. You know, it was, that was something else, you know, and, and it, you know, it, there were, I had like a folder of emails where I would be like, Hey man, you know, like throw up in the toilet, not in the bathtub. You know, and sort of little post-it note reminders. Yeah. Stuff like that. And then finally it got to a point where there was like this smell in the apartment that wouldn't go away. 
So my roommate lived in the part of the apartment that we're in right now. And I actually like I broke in here one night because I was like, I got to find out what this smell is. Is this like a decomposing hooker or what, you know? And I, so I broke in and um, he was morbidly obese and he had he had lost his job and become addicted to uh, to online gambling. Ugh. And he had been like hoarding jars of urine because he didn't want to like step away from the computer and oh miss his God. miss his hand. So he would just like piss in a bottle and it, it, they, there was like four of them here. So I finally went to the landlord and I was like, yo, you got to do something this, about this. this I mean, that's heavy. That's dark. Yeah. That's some seriously dark stuff. Yeah. What happened to that guy? I don't know, man. I mean, I think that, um, I think that that was a bot. Actually, I got a really nice email from him. That was a bottom of sorts for him and, you know, and sort of like getting kicked out of here. And he found a new place and got a new job and actually like dropped some weight and, you know, seemed to be doing much better. So that's good. So I, so I deserve a gold medal for throwing him out, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, you did him a, you were not codependent in that relationship, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So it's cool to, uh, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me over, man. Yeah, man. I got to say it's a, it's a big honor. Uh, the, the honor is, you know, I'm the one who's honored, man. I've been, uh, I've been watching your, uh, you know, your book just consistently kicked my ass on Amazon. I was like, who is this guy? Like, what is this? It's like sing, it's a Kindle single and it's consistently at the, you know, the top of the list and the running books and the category. Like I'm not, I'm not going to like the Kindle singles category to see who's number one there, but like, you, you know, you transcended that and showed up in, you know, the rankings for all the other books, like way up there, man. And was like wow somebody who wrote a kindle single is like killing it on amazon like what's what's the story here and i've been thinking i was sort of just ruminating on that you know i didn't know anything about you and that's when uh dean our mutual podcasting friend kind of introduced us uh, over the email and i was like oh that's awesome i'd love i'd love to meet that guy i've been thinking about that guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had i had a target on my back <laughs> no yeah, that that competitive nature in 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 sport uh going over into the amazon rankings well you i was you have to give me that victory then because that that will be the only place where i'll be. oh you own it you <laughs> own it i mean you were you were number one uh the number one kindle single uh for the long run uh, atop stephen king for how long i mean how long were you sitting it's, on the top of the roost there i mean it's hard it, for a while <laughs> like more than i can believe i mean had i done it once for one day that would be more than i would have ever hoped for but it, it right, was get the screen grab <laughs> yeah <laughs> i do I, I sent i did send a couple of those to yeah. my mom <laughs> like mom like forgive me look yeah. like i did it you know but um no it's it was it's been an amazing ride and you know what's what's most ironic about it is that i didn't want to write that story and i i resisted writing it um, mm -hmm. you know, my editor basically said he was like, um, he was like, this is your next story. This is what you're going to write about. And, uh, and it's going to be called the long run. And, you know, and I was like, Dave, you know, this is a guy, you know, this is David Blum, you know, well, you know, established mm -hmm. writer. He's been working as a writer and editor in New York for, you know, for a long time, knows his game. And of course I was like, Dave, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, like no one wants to hear my drunk -a log. Yeah, exactly. I was just like, nobody wants to, nobody wants another whiny book about like how I met, you know, how I totally screwed my life up and then just doing the like real hard work to sort of get it back. And, uh, and I was wrong. People love that stuff, man. You know, it's the hero's journey. Yeah. And you know, I, I think too, that like, America is really a place where um, some, where people come to reinvent themselves. I mean, you know, this is, uh, you know, the nation of second chance. You know, this is like, we'll give you another shot. You know, I mean, historically up, to, up till now, I mean, we love um, as much as we, we root for, you know, the underdog to triumph like Rocky or something like that. We also root for people who, who mess up and who make mistakes and then, you know, have to try and have to try and put it back well, together because it's very human, you know, we're all flawed and we all make mistakes and, and, uh, you know, I think people can emotionally identify with that. I, I, I have to say, man, I, um, you know, one of the worst things about me is, or two of the worst things. Okay. 
two of the many bad things about me are that I'm I'm really dismissive and I make really snap judgments. And um, I knew your sort of your your resume as an athlete before I read any of your book. And I was like, you know, and, you know, I hate to say it, but one of the downsides of the sort of ultra, you know, competitive community is that you run into a lot of ultra egos, too. Mm-hmm. And one of the first things that leapt out at me, um, you know, when I was reading your book was, uh, you know, you said something about like, you know, balance, that thing that's, you know, that still eludes me. And, uh, and it's like, as a reader right there, that's when I was with you, you know, it was cause I was like, oh, this guy has gone out and done all these superhuman things. And one of the first things that he's going to exposit for us is that he still, here's something that he still hasn't figured out. No, it's, uh, it, it constantly eludes me. And I think that that, you know, that's, um, you know, something that will, I'll have to, you know, continue to work really, really hard on for the rest of my life. And, you know, being, a you know, being an alcoholic, being an addict, being in recovery and, and knowing myself and my tendencies and, and, you know, my sort of attraction to extreme behavior and, you know, and, and many of which, you know, many of those don't serve me, um, and grappling with that and like how to kind of, you know, live in the world with that, carrying that around is, you know, it's, it's not easy and I'm not perfect at it by any stretch of the imagination. I'm, I'm usually very, very far, you know, from perfect. It's, you know, being a, you know, being a a drunk for a long time and watching people, watching other people getting sober and sort of reading these sobriety narratives, you know, I just sort of operated on the, you know, the assumption that once you stop drinking and once you got past the sort of, uh, you know, the sort of garish, you know, Hollywood dramatic uh, DTs where you're sweating and there's like bugs crawling through the walls and stuff like that, that then your life is sort of, you know, like sunshine and roses. That's not the case, no, man. It's not the case at all. It's not like, oh, I'm sober now and life is perfect and great and look how grand everything is and the sun shines every day, you know? And uh, I mean, certainly, you know, I don't know if you have this, but, you know, you do have the pink cloud and that, that lasts longer for some people than for others. And, you know, I experienced that, but, you know, then life sort of intervenes again. And, and you know, y- you know, you have problems that creep up like everybody else does and, and in many ways, at least in my experience, it's oftentimes more difficult to manage that because, you know, I'm like an emotional baby, you know, because I medicated myself for so long that when I finally got sober, I had the emotional maturity of, you know, like a 17 year old, like when I started using and drinking, you know, yeah. I, hadn't, I hadn't been able to develop tools like a normal human being for how to manage that kind of stuff. And so I'm really sensitive you know, I get really bent out of shape by small stuff and it, it can be very easily overwhelming for me. Yeah. I mean, that's my experience with, uh, with sobriety is that like sobriety is not the finish line. It's like the starting line. Exactly. You know, like you've gotten yourself far enough to get to the point where like you're in good enough shape to do something that's incredibly hard, you know? And, um, I, man, I know exactly what you're talking about. Cause you know, I mean, people tell me all the time, they're like, you know, you st- why do you still live like you're 16? And I was like, I still am 16. You know? <laughs> right. like, I'm starting from, you know, I'm starting from scratch. So, I mean, at this point you've been sober a couple of years now, like three years, two and a half years or something like that. Uh, yeah, coming up on four years. Right. Which, um, I, I never thought that I would do Which that. Which is huge, man. You know, yeah. congratulations. It's amazing. And, and yet at the same time, you know, you're still, you're still new, you know, you're still new and the nerve endings are, you know, there's probably a lot of nerve endings that are still really kind of raw. Yeah. Um, it, one of the parts of, of, uh, of finding ultra that I really loved was like sort of the slack period after you did the first Ultraman, because you're like, it's like, I went out and did this ridiculous, you know, grueling race, this, you know, and, and now what? you know, like what's, what's next? Do I, you know, like, what do you do after that? You know? And, and, and that's been my experience. Um, you know, I, 
you know, I started running, I went out real hard and real strong with, you know, just running on anger really. Um, you know, with no mm-hmm. training and no idea of like form or what to, you know, what the right shoes were to wear or what to eat or any of that information. Um, you know, and then went out and overran and injured myself and then, you know, had this awesome, like massive year where I just, you know, did like race after race after race. And then, um, you know, and then I burnt out a little bit mm-hmm. and, and well, you kind of proved to yourself that you could do it and you, so you crossed a couple finish lines. Yeah. And then, it, and then you kind of get to that place where you're like, well, well, what does this mean to me? Why am I, you know, what is it, you know, why am I doing this? What's driving this and, and what is important to me about this pursuit? Yeah. And, you know, and that was one of the things is that, um, for me, uh, running was a tool, um, you know, and it was just like, I, I was going to, if, if, you know, for example, if you're writing and you don't know where the story is going to go and it, you go out for a run, that's on your mind for the next four hours or however long you're mm-hmm. running, you know, you figure it out, you know? And, and I think that that's because, I mean, it's on your mind, but also when you're running, you're able to engage a different part of your consciousness and kind of tap into an, un, you know, your unconscious on a certain level. It's, in some ways you're turning your brain off and you're kind of letting go and it becomes that active meditation state that allows some of those, you know, creative pathways to engage in a different way. And, you know, I know when I'm struggling with something, whether it's a creative problem or just a life problem or an emotional problem, you know, oftentimes, you know, I find the solution on a run in a way that I would have never been able to if I was grinding at home trying to figure it out. Do you remember those, I mean, this is probably like late nineties, there were like optical illusions that they would print in the newspaper. And what you had to do was like, look at it and then like unfocus your eyes. And then you would see a 3d image. Mm, Vaguely. You mean like the, the lamp and the two faces kind of thing or no, it, it was, um, it was more sort of like, I'll figure out the, uh, exactly what it is, but you know, there's like an image there, but you can't see it if you look directly at it. And if your eyes focus, but you have, so you have to focus your eyes on like an imaginary point, six inches in front of what you're looking at. And then you'll see, you know, a wizard riding a dolphin or something, right. you know, ridiculous like that, you know? And, and, and that was my, you know, that's been my experience with running is that, um, you know, when I go, you know, when I go out, I'm, concentrating on sort of the discrete you know the the discrete task of like okay i've got to i've got to keep my speed up or i've got to not run too fast or i've got to you know so you're focusing on smaller things like that Mm -hmm. and then it's it's like while you're focusing on that it's, it's like oh i i forgive my sister for that thing that she did when i was in fifth grade or whatever you know you just get sort of like little gifts like that where it's like Oh, oh, yeah, I, I just figured that out. Oh, okay, cool. Right. It's a, it's almost like you're you're unplugging from, you know, the loops, you know, the I don't know about you, but like I'll just I'll get into a rut and my mind is loops on some thought, you know, and whether it's a, a resentment or, you know, a conflict or or whatever it is and I'll just walk around like obsessing on some little thing. And the and I can't unplug. You know, like I can, yeah. and, and I have to do, I have to change my environment. I have to change my behavior, but, and I almost can't will myself to stop thinking about it. Like I have to take an action that's going to shift that. And for me, you know, the easiest thing to do is to go work out, you know, like that almost does it for me. Yeah. I, it's, it's fun. Well, this, this will we'll actually sort of bring up another question I want to raise a, um, a friend of mine, uh, Jacob, who I lost in uh, 2001, he was a uh, he was a like a pretty hardcore weightlifter and a heroin addict, which mm-hmm. two things don't really go together. But right. um, you know, and I asked, I said, you know, and I, you know, and I was pretty hardcore drunk, and I was like, how can you bear to go to the gym, <laughs> you know? And uh, and he said, you know, it's it's the one thing that I know that removes that sort of nattering voice in your head, um, you know, better than drink or drugs is, you know, if you just to just work out hard to the point where you're like, so exhausted, that voice is quieted and it's like quiet in your head for a second. Um, there's no doubt about that. And I mean, when I was drinking, 
you know, if I could somehow find my way to go for a run or do some kind of physical activity, that was fuel for my thinking that I didn't have a problem, you know, because it's like, as long as I, if I, if I can get to the gym, even if for a half an hour and I, and I get through that, then like, I'm cool. You know, like I don't, I don't have anything that I need to look at in the mirror. Yeah. I, 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 man, I know that logic too well. I mean, you know, that was, I, I used to do the same thing, you know, with my drinking, you know, where I was like, well, you know, all right, I'll quit for a week there. I quit for a week. I'm not an alcoholic. Let's go get some whiskey. Right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like I said to you before we started recording that, you, you know, if I wasn't an alcoholic, I'd get drunk every night. You know, it's only an alcoholic thinks that way. And unless you're an alcoholic, like it's hard to relate to that, that mentality. And it's, I, I think it's something that, you know, is, is just distinct to the, to that kind of personality. And, you, you know, you're the first person I've had on the show who uh, is in recovery. And there's you know, a lot of people have been like, when are you going to, you know, kind of talk about the addiction stuff and, you know, I haven't really addressed it in audio format before. So this is, this is like new territory and, and I think it's important and I'm, I'm at peace with talking about it, but it's also like, it's a, it's, it's a vulnerable feeling, you know, and I wanted to know what it was like for you when you were writing the long run, which, you know, is, a, is a fantastic work, by the way. I mean, you're a very gifted writer. Thank you. And I love the story and, and I love the story, you know, and obviously I relate, you know, incredibly to, you know, kind of your, it's, it's the inner demons and the kind of grappling, you know, with the addiction that just like I can tap into immediately. Um, but to kind of sit down and go, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to pour a lot of this, you know, dark stuff and, and, you know, kind of, inner demons and secrets out on the paper for the world to see. I mean, what was that emotionally like for you? In, in two words, it sucked. (laughs) (laughs) Like it was, um, it was, you know, it was incredibly exhausting and it was, um, you know, and it was, it was, it was scary and I, you know, and I dreaded it and, you know, there were, you know, there were a lot of times where I was like, ah, you know, like I got to just not write anymore or, or I can't stop writing. And often I would, you know, I sort of have like both feelings at the same time. And, um, this is the thing though, is that, um, when I was writing that, I really had to go back and confront a lot of things that I'd, you know, I'd put behind me or I felt that I'd put behind me Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's, it's sort of like saying like, okay, what, what are the two things I'm scared of the most? Okay. I'm scared of the dark and I'm, I'm scared of the snakes. I'm going to fill up and, well, and I'm scared of drowning. I'm going to fill a pool with snakes, turn out the lights and jump into it, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? And <clears throat> so, so that sucked, but the end result of getting out of the pool alive and turning the lights back on, you know, was, I was like, huh, even that didn't kill me, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and then it's, um, it's cathartic. Well, yeah, it's, it's it's more than, it's more than that. There's a sense of, yeah, there's a sense of, of relief. Isn't the right word, but, um, I guess freedom, you know, because just the simple act of writing it down on some level is making peace with it or at least acknowledging it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I was really, there's a lot of stuff in that story too, that I was really reluctant to put out there, you know, because, um, there were secrets, you know, it was stuff that I'd hidden from my friends and my family and, um, and with good reason, you know, there's a Mm -hmm. lot of, a lot of real dark, you know, and raunchy and horrible stuff in there. And, um, you know, and, and most of it, you know, just sort of like deep, deep nihilism. And, uh, it, it's, we, it is, it's weird and alarming at times that, you know, that information is out there. Um, but man, the response that I've gotten from people has just been so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It's been, um, you know, I mean, I've gotten so many, you know, emails and Facebook messages from people who are, you know, who are like, oh, you know, this is just like my journey or, um, you know, this was so meaningful to me. Uh, you know, and also like I've had so many, I've had a, a bunch of people who, 
who don't run, who aren't athletic, who don't have substance abuse issues, who have read it and said, man, this really spoke to me, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's weird, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, and that makes me so, you know, you know, so happy that, you know, that Dave pushed me to write it and that I had the, uh, you know, that I had the hood spot to like, to go through with it. Mm -hmm. Well, they say in recovery that you're only as sick as your secrets, you know, and when you, when you hold on to those secrets and you harbor them and they fester that they, you're only fertilizing them to, you know, grow larger. And when you expose them to the light, they perish, you know, or they diminish. And so having the courage to, to do that, I mean, first of all, you know, I applaud anyone who's, who's willing to be that vulnerable. And I think that, you know, you're being authentic to who you are and it takes, it takes a lot of courage to say, this is who I am. And, uh, and, you know, I'm kind of staking my claim for that and you're going to think whatever you're going to think about it. Um, and for you to be at peace with it enough to share that with the world is, you know, it's, it's a triumph for anybody to do that. Well, I mean, thanks man. Thanks. And I think that, that it, and I, and I think that, um, and I think that that's why, you know, this single has done well because it's, you know, it's authentic to who you are as a person and people see that. So even if they're like, they're not an athlete, they're not a, you know, in recovery, they're not an addict or whatever, they can feel the authenticity, you know, and that's, and, and that's what they're connecting to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the way that I wrote it when I was writing it was I, just tried to imagine that I was writing like a long journal entry that no, <laughs> that nobody else would see, <laughs> you know, and, and to just be completely honest as if, you know, as if I was like, you know, speaking to a priest or something like that and nobody would, nobody would ever see it. Nobody would ever hear it, you know, no problem. Um, so I just wrote with that in my mind. And then before I could stop myself, I sent it to my editor like that. And he was like, He's like, this is great. I have a couple small changes and let's go, you know? And I was like, wait, <laughs> oh, wait, wait. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> that is, I'm laughing because that's exactly what I did. I said, you know, I was sit, I would sit down and I'd start to write and I go, the only way that I can get this out is if, if, is if I get in the mindset that this, that nobody in the world is going to read this and I'm just writing it for myself. It's a private journal entry. And, uh, but then every once in a while I'd like, flash to some, you know, image in my mind of the book on a shelf at Barnes and Noble. And I would just absolutely panic, (laughs) (laughs) be unable to write for a couple days. And, and I still remember, um, you know, and I, and I kind of overwrote everything because I just wanted to get it all out. And then I'm like, now I have something to work with. And, And the manuscript that I turned in was like 150 pages longer than the book ultimately ended up being. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my, you know, a lot of my drunk log got cut down, you know, a lot. And, and it was much darker and gnarlier. <clears throat> it got whitewashed a little bit, uh, by my editor. And I think, you know, in the best interest of the book and mine was a little bit different cause I was trying to balance, you know, essentially three different stories. It's like the addiction story, the athletic story, and then, you know, kind of weaving a diet book in there at the same time. Like I was, you know, I was like, how am I going to make this all work? And, so a lot of stuff got, you know, trimmed and I had some, you know, pretty dark, uh, episodes from, from the drinking days in there that ultimately didn't make it in. But I remember when I turned the, turned the manuscript into my editor, I just looked at my wife and I was like, I hope this isn't the biggest mistake of my life. You know, it's terrifying Yeah, to be that exposed, you know, do I really want to do this? Is this really a good idea or not? It's, um, you know, before I was, um, before I was getting ready to publish the long run, I, I was speaking to a friend of mine who's a writer and I, you know, and I said, you know, I've, I have grave misgivings about sending this out into the world because it sort of exposes me as just like, just a crappy human being. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just like, um, and you know, and not in a glamorous way, just like scumbag. And, uh, you know, and he looked at me and he was like, Mishka, honestly, there's nothing you could publish now that's going to, that's going to make you seem worse than the stuff that you've already published, you know? <laughs> so, um, and I was like, great. <laughs> so, you know, I, I guess, you know, I, that is the thing though, is that like, once you, you know, once you come out, you know, with these stories and you're like, oh yeah, I got really drunk and then I pissed the bed. 
you know, then then no one can embarrass you with it because because you own it because right. that's your story and you you know and you've told that story and like and the other thing is that um inevitably like if you tell that story somebody will come up to you later and say man one time i pissed the bed too and that person may be a really hot woman <laughs> <laughs> which actually this yeah. leads me to my next question and this has been like my burning question who's, i want to ask who's you. interviewing who here <laughs> We'll, we'll we'll pass the hat yeah. back and forth. Does your wife Julie have a sister? <laughs> because uh, that mm-hmm. when I was reading your book, I was like, I was like, man, this woman is like, like the patience of Gandhi or something. I mean, because I know what drunks are like, and I know what it's like to live with a drunk, and mm-hmm. you know, and and to li- and and not only that, and to li- to live with somebody in recovery, to live with somebody who's trying to get back on their feet, and to live with somebody who's training as much as you were and, and as hard as you know, as you were. And, um, she really stuck with you through a radical transformation. Yeah, she did. I mean, uh, she's, first of all, she's much more spiritually evolved than I am for sure. And, uh, and she walks her walk. Um, I mean, we met, we met after I got sober. So she didn't, you know, she didn't see me in the, you know, in the, in the depths. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, a lot of those behavior patterns, you know, crop up and, you know, it's sort of like, it becomes less about not drinking and it becomes more about like the, you know, the sort of, um, acting out or kind of behavior patterns that, you know, you see in alcoholics that are, that are dry or, you know, not, actively engaged in, you know, whatever works for them to keep them on the straight and narrow. And yeah, she's been amazing. And, and none of this, I mean, in all honesty, like none of this would have happened. Ultraman, the book, everything that's come from it all starts with her, you know, patience and belief in me and sort of, um, I guess, I guess what it is, it, it, you know, initially she was like, you know, you, you know, you should try this. You should do that. She'd put books on my nightstand that I wouldn't read. You know, she would say, <laughs> you should be trying this or, you know, what you need to change your diet. It's not looking good. You know, I mean, she'd always like call, you know, she'd call me out. Like she called, you know, she's a strong person and she'd say, you know, you look like a hell dude. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? And I, and she, and that wasn't working. Like she fatigued of that pattern with me and, and she got to a place where she was like, all right, if I'm going to stay married to this guy, like I'm going to have to just love him the way he is and let go of my desire or need for him to change. Even if I can see through this mirage of who he is and I can see a better version of him and I can see how he can get there, but he's not listening to me and I'm just banging my head against the wall. And it was when she finally kind of let go and detached mm-hmm. from that completely that I began to change. And so there's this weird kind of like spiritual calculus that took place in that. And maybe on some unconscious level, I was registering like, Oh wait, she's not pushing me anymore. Like now it's on me, you know? So it wouldn't be like, I'm doing it for her. Like I have to, I have to own this situation that I'm in. I have to own my behavior patterns and I have to want to change for myself. And honestly, you know, you can't sustain any kind of lifestyle change anyway, unless you inherently want it inside of you. Yeah. That, I mean, that's the thing is you, you can't, um, it's incredibly difficult to force someone to change. And even if you force them to change, it, it's, it's not going to stick. It's not going to, no, of course not. Yeah, because they're not doing it for the right reasons. They're yeah. doing it to please somebody else rather than they're not internally driven to do it. Like, yeah. oh, I don't want my wife to leave me. So I'm going to change. Well, that's. You know, although I understand that and it's not a bad reason, but the chances of that um, being a sustainable change are not good. You you can't force someone to want to change. And, no. you know, and I, and I think that, you know, she recognized that and it's, it's funny. I mean, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, a very big, very like gracious gesture that you make by saying that like none of this would have happened without her. But I think that also that's, it speaks to your strength as a writer because, that's totally transparent in the book and you may, you know, you make it abundantly clear, you know, to readers that like that, that this is a group effort, you know, that mm-hmm. she, 
that she really had your back at every step. Yeah. And I acknowledge the support. I mean, left to my own devices. I mean, you know, I'm pissing the bed and eating Jack in the box and living like a, you know, like a, like a hobbit, you know, in, in like 10 day old underwear. I mean, you know, it's like, I'm not good on my own, you know, I know, I, I, know. I don't trust myself. So I, I, what I meant to say is I have no idea yeah. what you're talking about, Rich. <laughs> yeah. I've never been like that. I don't. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, um, no, it's, it's true. And, uh, she, uh, yeah, she actually wrote a blog post on that very subject that was on mind, body green that did really well, kind of like, you know, navigating relationships and pitfalls in relationships and like how she kind of approaches me when I'm difficult, which is, you know, on a regular basis and, and her ability to kind of like, just be non plused by whatever I'm doing and kind of like, Hey man, that's, that's you, you know, don't, don't invade my space, you know, with mm -hmm. whatever nonsense that you're coming, you know, at me with, whether it's negative energy or, or, or whatever it is. And she's, you know, it takes a strong constitution for that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm lucky, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm blessed in that regard, you know, and I realize not everybody is in a relationship like that and I don't take it for granted. I, um, you know, more than one friend has commented to me that I'm an angry guy and that I get angry easily. And that, you know, that when I get angry, it's, it's explosive, you know? And, um, and that's one of the things that like, that's one of the things about getting sober. That's tough, man, is because, you know, back in the day when, when I got mad, I'd have a drink and I'd feel better. Or when I got sad, I'd have a drink and I'd feel better. Or like when I was, when I couldn't get to sleep, I'd have a couple of drinks and then I could sleep. And when I couldn't wake up, I'd have a drink and that would wake me up, you know? And, you know, and then I got to the point where I was taking all these different pills and stuff too. Like, oh, I'm too stressed out. I'm going to take a Xanax. You know, I need to like, you know, I need to do a line in order to get through the show or whatever. And then, and then when you get sober, you're left with nothing. Right. All your medicine is taken away. I mean, you used, you used all these substances to manage your emotional being and, you know, it worked for a while or obviously you wouldn't have, you know, done it as long as you did. And then it stops working. And then you're faced with this dilemma, uh, you know, and, and this letting go process. And then you're, you have that momentary elation of being sober and, you know, the great accomplishment that that is. And then that wears off. And then you're like, now what, you know, I'm, you're, you're like we said before, you know, a raw nerve without the, without the tools to kind of deal with those emotions when they come up. And, you know, I, th I think that it gets into a little bit, I mean, for me and, you know, without kind of like, you know, breaking anonymity or whatever, I mean, I work like, you know, I work a certain program that works for me, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I know that you have a kind of a different approach to your sobriety, but I know that if I'm not using the tools that I, you know, that I learn and <laughs> that I utilize uh you know in the rooms as they say that you know i'm in trouble yeah and you know listen i mean i um it's funny you know when when you when you do something that people take attention to you often become the, the poster boy for several different causes some of which you you don't support or mm -hmm. you you're uneasy you know uneasy with the amount of support you know you're uneasy in the way you've been cast um, I, you know, I, yeah, I, I quit, you know, I stopped drinking on my own. Um, after I'd been quit for a little while, um, I started going to talk therapy and that, you know, and that was helpful for a little while, you know, the counselor I was talking to wasn't incredibly helpful. Um, and then I switched and started talking to another counselor and that was better. But, um, you know, I didn't, um, you know, I didn't go through any sort of, you know, peer network or, I didn't go to, to any kind of group or group therapy or anything. Um, you know, and so a lot of people look to me as the guy who's, you know, going to, you know, sort of puncture this horrible organization that is AA. And that's not how I feel. You know, I, um, I have a lot of friends in the program and I think there's a lot of wisdom that's come out of it. Um, me, who I am is sort of, you know, pig headed guy that I am, I got to do it my way, man, you know, and that's, and that's the only way it was going to work for me. And it, you know, if I had to like, if somebody, you know, if I had to get sober in, in jail, then it would have lasted until I got out. And, uh, 
you know, and if I, especially if, if in the early days I had people telling me, um, you've got to do it a certain way, you've got to do it a certain way, I would have just, that would have driven me right back to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not here to, you know, to judge you in any respect. I mean, you've stayed sober for four years and you've, you've, you know, found a way that works for you. And, and, uh, you know, I have no opinion on that. I just, I just know for myself, um, my way is usually not the right way, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think, and I tried my way, you know, for many years, uh, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to come into AA. I wanted to do it myself. And I had my ideas about how I could solve the problem and none of those worked and the hole just got deeper. And it wasn't until I got to a place where I was able to kind of quash my ego and say, you know, well, maybe there's a better way or set aside my notion of what I thought was best and, and, and really, you know, not try to will myself into the solution, but to, you know, surrender and allow other people to help me and to take direction and to kind of have that humility, which is not, you know, my default setting by any <laughs> stretch of the imagination, um, was when, you know, I, I allowed the solution to take root and that's what worked. That's what's worked for me and continues to work for me. Yeah. And I mean, it's funny, um, you know, what you said, uh, you know, about having no judgment. I mean, that's, that's exactly the same way that I feel, uh, you know, towards you actually, no, it's, it's, it's more, it's, it's deeper than that, which is that, um, I support you no matter what way you're using to make your life better, mm -hmm. you know? And that's the thing is that if, you know, if someone, if someone gets sober by doing jigsaw puzzles four hours a day and like, that's their thing, I'm for it. I mm -hmm. support it. You know, whatever, whatever process you need to, you know, to feel better, to live better, to have a more fulfilling life, whatever works for you, I totally support, you know? Right. And, um, one of the, one of the most interesting stories that I've sort of run into um, after the publication of the long run is uh, my friend Gerard in Portland. And I, I met him a couple of times, um, you know, when I was like on tour and stuff like that, big boy, like over 400 pounds. I think he's lost 80 pounds to date, mm -hmm. which, you know, just blows my mind. I mean, it makes me think that like what I did of like, you know, stopping drinking and, you know, running a couple of 50 mile races is nothing, you know, because when I, I think that's one of the things that we're for, you know, that you and I are fortunate in, um, you know, being primarily drunks is that you don't need alcohol from day to day to live, but you need food, but you need food. Yeah. So, you know, and food is, you, you know, I look at, I tend, because of my experience, I tend to look at a lot of things through the prism of addiction and, and recovery. And, and it, it, you know, the kind of longer I sort of walk this path, the more I'm convinced that, you know, it's, it transcends alcohol and drugs. And it, it really, you know, it invades all of our behavior patterns, you know, and our relationship to television or, you know, food and foods that don't serve us or exercise or gambling or, you know, porn or whatever it is, like whatever your kind of vice is or your secret is or whatever. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's rampant. And I think that, you know, it's sort of like the analogy is sort of like, you know, in the seventies when, you know, they called smoking a habit and, you know, nobody, the, the idea that like nicotine was addicting was not even part of the discourse, you know, and it's sort of like, oh, you know, I have this habit of watching reality TV or I, have, you know, I have this, you know, habit of doing this or that. And it's like, no, actually, you know, you, you need to look at it like it, these things really are just because they're behaviors and not substances. They have equal power over us, you know, and somebody who, you know, I have a friend who, who, uh, has been sober a long time and sober like 21 years, uh, amazing guy, uh, former heroin addict. And he's like, I never thought that anything would be harder than kicking heroin, but I'm having such a hard time with food. Like I just can't solve this problem, you know? And, 
And he's finally starting to really realize like how his relationship with food is addiction based and breaking those patterns because you do have to eat every day can make your life really unmanageable and the health consequences are profound. Yeah. I, um, it's ironic. I, <clears throat> for the last couple of months, I've been working with my, my buddy, uh, Jed Collins, who works, uh, who lives downstairs, who's a, uh, he's a comic artist. Um, so we're putting together a comic book, uh, from a story that I wrote 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, you know, and it basically follows, you know, there was one episode when I was a little kid where I like stole a big bag of chocolate chips and then my mom busted me with them, uh, downstairs, you know, just sort of like, like chocolate all over my face. It was like the mm-hmm. summertime. And I think I was like the, I think the only thing that I had that had pockets was my winter coat. So I'd like put my winter coat on. So I'm way too hot in my winter coat with the, you know, chocolate chips in my pocket, like chocolate all over my hands and my fingers and all over my face. And she just, she just had this response. Like when she caught me that she was like, Oh no, like what's coming, you know? And I I think she knew then that I was going to wind up to have big problems down the line, Yeah, you know? And, um, and I, I still, you know, I have a, uh, I have a, a friend who I just love to death who's in the program. And, uh, you know, he and I used to be drinking buddies. And um, he actually taught me how to drink. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to watch him eat is like, it brings me right back to when we would go out drinking together. And, you know, and just be like, you know, bring me, bring me four Jack and Cokes. And, uh, you know, to see him with, with, you know, stirring a big thing of ice cream with a Snickers bar and like putting honey on the ice cream and stirring. <laughs> right. I mean, that is, you know, that's an unhealthy relationship with food right there. And, yeah. you know, and when you're, you know, when you're an addict or an alcoholic and you remove the substances again, it's like the behavior patterns are still there, you know, like. There's work that needs to be done to oh, modify that. When, you know? when I was like, when I was need- talking about that, my mouth started watering because yeah. I was like, "Oh shit, that sounds really good." <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's powerful for sure. I mean, you know, and when you were talking about your anger issues, and you know, I mean, sort of like what are the tools that you use to quell that or manage it or you know what is your plan for you know overcoming that or transcending this you know behavior pattern that isn't serving you or is you know causing you you know is disruptive in your life rich i'm starting to figure it out man (laughs) i'm starting to grow up i think i've grown up from uh you know 13 to maybe 15 now and i i'm i'm proud of myself for that i um a a big thing is it's not unfamiliar for me anymore so now when i when something happens and i get angry it's like oh i i i'm ready for this you know it's it's the uh it's the enemy i know versus the enemy i don't know and um you know, when I, you know, when I got really mad before I would just, you know, go out and run until I couldn't run anymore, or like do push ups until I couldn't do push ups anymore. And, and I think those are fine outlets because, um, you know, that's a great way to, well, to get yeah, motivated for course. a workout, but and it's, it's not and always, it's, it's better than picking up a drink or, yeah. you know, popping a pill. But I, I think the, you know, and I think this is a part that, you know, the, the place in our lives that we're both in now is, is we're, we're trying to sort of narrow the aperture, you know, so you get, you get alcohol out of your life and that's a huge step, you know, and then it's breaking that like food addiction. That's another huge step. And you know, you just sort of like, you know, each day or each month or each year, just get a little bit better. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, they say the road gets narrower, you know what I mean? Because certain things that used to not bother you that, you know, in, in your behavior or I should speak for myself. Um, then suddenly they become bothersome to me. Like, you know, I, that's no longer, it's no longer acceptable to me that I do this, whatever it is. And then it's like time to look at that pattern, but it's also like squeezing a water balloon, you know, like once you feel like you've pushed down and gotten a hold on one kind of thing, then it pops out, you know, somewhere else. And so there's no destination, 
you know, it's a life journey uh, that will never be fully mastered by any stretch of the imagination. So it's just about, you know, what is the progress that you can make and where are the improvements? You know, where, where do I need to be? What do I need to be working on next? That is that, you know, the, the next frontier. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's like, um, it's like that annoying mantra that your buddy kept throwing in your face. You know, that's why they call it a challenge. (laughs) It's like, it's hard, but like, it's hard because it's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, it wouldn't be worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And like, Am I going to be fighting this fight for the rest of my life? Yeah. Am I up for it? Hell yeah. You know, it's worth doing, man. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, I really just went from, uh, you know, I I couldn't even hold down a job in a bar. And, and you know, the guys at the bars were always like so nice when they fired me or usually they were, you know, and it was just sort of like. You know, the like, like the hey, shrug man, and the smile. Do you, like, what do you want us to do? Man? Yeah, you yeah. Know, like, like, you know, and I know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh, and it's that thing. Like, here's something I wanted to get. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's your thought. <laughs> I, I had one boss once who said, "We just feel like you don't care." <laughs> it's like, bingo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you tend not to care when you're, you know, when you're drinking a lot, but. There's this thing that that I got, you know, that I'm getting from you that I relate to a lot, which is this idea of, you know, on the one hand, you know, when you're out there and you're you're using, there's that deep shame, you know, because you're harboring this secret and and it's just it's horrible, right? You don't want anyone to know, and you just feel like the lowest person on earth, um, and yet at the same time, simultaneously, while you're sort of, kind of, you know letting that fester this idea that you're better than everyone else, like this superiority complex and in inferiority complex kind of operating at absolutely the same instant. It's funny, you know, I mean, I, I called a really good friend out on that the other day. And when I was driving home, I was like, how, how was I able to recognize that in him? And then I was like, Oh yeah, that's cause that's what I do you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, and that, and I, I did, I mean, I definitely had that, you know, that combination of arrogance and insecurity, you know, where I was like, I'm the worst thing ever. I have, I have no merit whatsoever. Um, but if like, you know, if I'm a drunk and I can still, you know, do the stuff that I do and you guys aren't drunks and you can't do it, then like you're even, you're, you're more pathetic than I am. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's a horrible way to live. It is. It's a, it's a weird false pride that, um, that, uh, that I had as well. And I think, you know, our stories are, are, you know, different in many ways, but they're, you know, the, the important aspects of our story, I think are very common. And that is that idea of, you know, like, Hey man, I can go out and I can, you know, do Jaeger shots all night and drink 25 beers. And I, and I'm still going to, you know, be better than you at this test in college or write a better paper than you and get the A or whatever, or, you know, get into Columbia, you know, all these sorts of things that, that kind of, um, they keep you out there because you think that, you know, you can keep, you can do this and you can do it better than anyone else. And, you know, burning it at both, both, you know, burning the candle at both ends. Yeah, it's, I mean, and I mean, academics are a a great example of that because it's only in the last six months, maybe that I'm starting to realize that I'm gifted at writing. Mm -hmm. And you (laughs) are like now I'm figuring out that it just comes easier to me than it does to other people because I, you know, I watch, you know, some of my musician friends who will just like hear a song on the radio and just pick up a guitar and figure it out. Or like, um, you know, they're playing it lefty, they're playing it righty and they can just, you know, they can just figure, learn new instruments, you know, no problem. And, and I, I'd labor, you know, at playing guitar. I'm just, I'm, you know, been playing for 30 years and I'm the worst. And, um, yeah, but you're also, you know, 
you're not the worst, dude. You know, I mean, you're you're, I mean, you're in these bands and you've played with all these people and you've toured and you've got albums and you've got an apartment here that's got like seven thousand guitars in it and like amp stack floor to ceiling. And you know, and I heard you say that on Dean's show too. You're like, I'm a terrible musician. And and you know, that's kind of an alcoholic thing to say too, because that's not yeah. that's not an honest account of of who you are as a musician. I don't think. Yeah. And I, I don't mean, think you believe that either, or you wouldn't be trying to finish this next album that you're trying to finish. That's, I mean, it's a tough question. Um, I, I keep, you know, I keep coming back to music as something that's incredibly meaningful in my life. The same way that running is meaningful, the, way, the same way that sobriety is meaningful is that, I can I can do it and do it and do it and do it and never feel like I've beaten it, you know. Like like I've I found something bigger than me, you know. And and that was a big thing, you know, when I was when I was younger. Is just that, um, you know, even if I didn't win the fight, like I could, I, I, you know, I showed people that I could take a punch, you know, and um, and that I could suffer really well, <laughs> you know. I was mm-hmm. good at I was. You know, when it, you know, those battles of attrition, you know, I would, I would la- outlast other people. And, um, and I, you know, and that's I, the, that's this, the, the power of the self will, you know, like this incredible self will that you have mm-hmm. that I think is, 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 you know, germane to the alcoholic. Yeah. It's, you know, it's funny, like being a sort of like a real strong headed guy. Um, I think that's what kept me drinking for as long as I did in the face of the mounting evidence that I was an alcoholic yeah. and that, and that I had to stop. Um, you know, when, when I finally stopped drinking, people were like, well, you know, what happened? You know, it must've been something really horrible. And I was like, no, there wasn't really any like one new horrible thing. It was like just all the other stuff that I'd ignored sort of finally sunk in, you know, that, um, you know, in no way was this a fulfilling life. Right. I mean, just, you know, mm. y- you hear it all the time. Like one day you just, you wake up and you're done. It doesn't have to be some epic, you know, like a building doesn't have to fall on your head or you don't have to, you know, kill somebody in an auto accident. You can just say, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what happened for me. I just, um, I don't want to say I've never craved a drink since then, but you know, it, it's like this, you know, the spell was over, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I could just see that, uh, I'd had every, I'd had every good night on alcohol that I was going to have and that the bad nights were just going to repeat themselves. Right. Until I had one night that I didn't, I wasn't going to wake up from. And I think it's a fallacy in recovery with, you know, this idea that oh, now that you're sober, you, you know, you're not going to crave it or there aren't going to be moments that are, you know, going to be tricky to to navigate i mean that's the the miracle is is that you know an alcoholic isn't drunk all the time you know it's it's a miracle that you're not drinking and so i think it's important to acknowledge like hey i'm still you know an alcoholic i'm choosing not to drink today um and some days are easier than others but but uh to sort of deny you know like this pressure to like be this person who, you know, holds themselves out to the world. Like I'm recovered and I don't think about it anymore and all of that. That's great, but that's not every day for me for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that my, that my experience has been atypical and I know that there are people who struggle every day. Um, and man, I mean, my heart really goes out to them because for me, it's, I think for me, it's a lot more about sort of, it's, it's more about alcoholic behavior than alcohol itself at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have to stop myself reaching for a glass as much as I have to stop myself from having a thought, you know, or thinking in that way. Um, you know, I mean, one of my, uh, You know, thoughts and emotions are going to happen, though. It's what's important is how you behave in 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 reaction to those. Well, 
one one of the things that I am really proud of is that uh, my mantra the last couple of years before I quit drinking was just, you know, fuck it. You know, everybody's got to die. I've got to die someday. What, what day is it today? Monday, Monday night, great night to go out, you know, fuck it. And I, and now when I'm in traffic and somebody cuts me off or I knock one of the million guitars that you see around the apartment <laughs> I, I knock one of them over and you know it puts a, a dent in the fingerboard or something like that i think fuck it it's not such a big deal mm-hmm. you know and so i've sort of been able to invert that um but, but yeah man those thoughts still you know that's the thing is you there is no uh there is no firewall that's uh that's perfect um, you know, and, and in fact, one of the things that I think, um, helped me in the long run, uh, you know, with, with quitting alcohol was working in a bar because, um, every night that I worked, you know, there was like the entire alphabet of alcohol there mm-hmm. available for me free the alpha and the omega, you know, of alcohol. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so I knew that I wasn't avoiding temptation, you know, that it was sort of like it was, because that's the thing is if you want to drink, man, you'll find a drink, whether it's vanilla extract or rubbing alcohol or mouthwash. Mm -hmm. If you're determined to get a drink, there's always one available. And seeing, you know, so seeing it there, seeing it all right there in front of me, that was, um, you know, it made it clear that it was, you know, that the change had happened in me, that it wasn't just a situational thing. And then also, toward, you know, towards the end of my shift working at the bar, when you see people just behaving horribly. Right. I was like, the, oh. the romance is yeah. no longer. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, th- this is done. This right. is totally over. All right. I got to go to the bathroom. Hold on a second. We've got to pause. Please hang up and try again. Uh, I feel much better after the break. <laughs> but uh, no, I wanted to um, circle it back to, you know, you were you were kind of making this distinction between your musical talent and your writing talent and how, you know, music, essentially what you were saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, music comes hard to you and you have to really apply yourself and, and, and you know that there's sort of a glass ceiling for you in terms of your innate talent, but that with writing, you're finally accepting that, you know, you, you, you do have like a gift for this and that it comes easier for you. And you're, you're embracing that in a, I guess in a new way. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I mean, we, we talked a little bit about, you know, sort of going out and boozing it up and like, you know, still, you know, doing fine academically. And, um, when I was younger, you know, it made me think, you by know, the like, way, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. So do you get like shit for like coming off arrogant in, in, in your account of that? Like, Oh yeah, I'm supposed to feel sorry for this guy. He's like, you know, he got into Columbia when he was a drunk, you know, do you, do you get like blowback? (laughs) If, if I ever have the good fortune to teach a writing class, the first writing or the first reading assignment will be for people to read all my one star reviews on Amazon. Right. I got a few myself. I've got some really, really nasty ones. My favorite. I'm going to, this, this is so great. I read it to my kids the other day. My favorite one-star review on my book is, this book is fantastic if you're George Bush. And it goes on to talk about like how I had this you know crazy privileged background where my dad bailed me out of every like you know pitfall that I ever had in my whole life and took care of me. It's like the way that this guy projected whatever baggage he was carrying onto my life, you know, and I, I'm like, when I told my story, it was like, I can't get around the, you know, I grew up in a very, you know, nurturing household. Like, you know, I had and my you needs met. you should never met, apologize. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to apologize. And I'm not going to, you know, for the psych, the sake of creating additional drama, take, you know, poetic license with that and make it sound like something that it wasn't. It just is what it is. And like people, some people will connect with that and other people won't. And, but I've taken flack for that. Like, oh, you know, you went to Stanford and, you know, I'm supposed to feel bad for you or. Yeah, I mean the you know the Columbia thing like people make a big deal about it and um 
you know what? I'm I'm still ninety thousand dollars in debt from Columbia. Mm-hmm. So if if anybody's if anybody's jealous of me, <laughs> I'm I'm willing to trade places with you on that one. Come on, man! You're supposed um, to be here telling me how you're hammering these huge Amazon checks every day that come <laughs> in the mail on a daily basis. Dude, look around the apartment. <laughs> Where do you think it's going? Yeah. <laughs> All right, but to get back, so so sort of embracing this talent you, you, that you have, and and by the way, like, um, you know, I just retweeted today the article that you put up on uh, that the I reports on CNN about um, running a marathon on on Sunday to uh, to honor the Boston victims, and I want to talk about that in a little bit. But you know, that could have been a very kind of bland post. That just said, you know, I'm going to get out there. It could have been a very straight up the middle, but it's very clear. And I don't know how much time you spent writing that, but you read that and you're like, oh, this is not like just an average blog post. Like this is writ, this is beautifully composed the way that you wrote that. Well, th- thank you. I mean, this is, this is the thing is that like, you know, I mean, I was probably drunk from like 15 to 32, <laughs> Um, you know, so th- through most of my academic career, you know, and so, you know, a typical thing is that I would go out and get wasted and then spend an hour writing a paper and turn it in thinking this is total garbage. And then my professor would write something saying like, you know, this, this is a fantastic paper, or, you know, this really, really moved me or, you know, new insights or whatever. And, and I would take that feedback and say, Oh, well, this is proof that the world is meaningless. If I can, if I can crank this out on a couple hours, um, and like impress people, then it's proof that, um, you know, that, 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 that literature doesn't exist or that trying to communicate through these little, you know, these little squiggles is meaningless. Well, and when, what it is actually in actuality is just incredibly poor self-esteem that, you know, that, 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 that your your talent still was able to transcend that low self esteem to be able to you know deliver prose on that level. Rich, the next nice thing you say about me, I'm going to give you a Charlie <laughs> horse because I can't deal with it. <laughs> it's like this is the thing, well, that's, and, it, and that's your low self esteem right there. I know this is the thing. Like if if you were just giving me like a series of direct personal attacks, I could I can handle that way better than I can handle you saying somebody who whose work I admire and whose uh whose accomplishments I'm envious of to like sit on my couch in my filthy apartment and say nice things about me <laughs> that's a that's a specific hell right Look, there man, I'm it's talking like, to the guy who like is you know <laughs> been on the moth like you know you've done like some amazing you've done some amazing things man yeah. like just own it I, I I know I can't yet I can't it's uh l- let me back it up all right so I, to get this great feedback from, from my professors, you know, at esteemed academic institutions, I would just think, oh, it's all bullshit. When really now I'm getting to a point where I can go back and say, no, um, I was gifted and, and, and I am gifted and I have a gift to be able to, <coughs> you know, to write well and, I seem to be grateful for it and, and appreciate it. And, um, it's a lot to learn, man. I mean, learning something like that, it's not like, uh, it's not, you know, the, the paradigm is not losing your virginity. Like you do it once and then it's done. It's like, it's like making your bed, you know, like I have to, I have to teach that thing to myself every day. You know, I forget it. And then I'm like, Oh, oh yeah, I have a gift for writing. It's great. I need to appreciate it. I, I, you know, I have some merit as a human being. I need to remember that, you know, I'm probably not going to end up collecting the carts at a grocery store or working as a squeegee man, which is what I, how I assumed my life would end, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, do you, and, and so do you feel an added sense of responsibility to tend to that? Um, to to tend to my, well, my own to, sense to, of to, self worth, no, or no, to to kind of get to a place where you're in acceptance of this talent that you have, and say, okay, well, what, this talent comes with responsibility. Like it's my responsibility to pursue this seriously and and lean into it, as opposed to deflect it. Um, 
Well, I, I think there's a third option. Um, my, my father was, was sort of, you know, he's a very gifted, uh, physicist and, uh, he was sort of oppressed by his father as a child, you know, saying like, you have this gift with that gift, you have this responsibility and you have to do this. You have to take care of other people. And I guess the way that I try to frame it is that I have an awesome opportunity and I'm just waking up to it now, man, that like. I can have this life where I go and do like crazy races with my friends and hang out and like, you know, eat watermelon on the trail, like running the Finger Lakes fifties with, you know, some amazing runners. And I get to, I get to hang out in my underwear all day and like basically write the equivalent of, you know, like a long, funny email to my mom (laughs) and, and people will read it and people will, will dig it. You know, Mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to just say, trying to learn to go with the flow, man, and say like, oh, you know, work to your strengths, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, What do you think is, you know, I'm, I'm obsessed with creative people. I'm obsessed, (laughs) I'm obsessed with artists and, you know, it's, there's like a, there's definitely like a jealousy (laughs) aspect of that, you know, uh, going on. And, and I find that you know, in recovery, I, I, I just meet some of the most brilliant, creative people that I've ever met. Um, and I'm interested in, in your thoughts on, you know, there's this nexus between, you know, sort of the romanticization of using drugs and alcohol and, and, and how that fosters creativity or the sort of misidentification Mm. of that relationship uh, and then getting sober and saying, Oh my God, I'm like, I'm never going to have another creative thought. How am I going to be an artist without this crutch that I thought was stimulating all of my creativity? Yeah. I mean, as a musician and as a songwriter, I certainly built, built all my writing around alcohol and around, you know, around being a drunk and, um, and around drinking and failing, you know, um, hold on. I'm going to close the door. All right. No problem. So, I mean, as a musician and as a songwriter, I really built my sense of self around, you know, alcohol and failure, which were like my two sidekicks, you know? And then now I find myself in a really bizarre situation where, I think I have an audience of people who would be interested in my music. And I, I really feel weird about playing my old stuff and I'm not writing a lot of new stuff. So yeah, that's, you know, that's a corner that I've yet to turn. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, what I hear all the time is, you know, is that there, there is that fear. And then ultimately, um, you know, with a foundation of sobriety, these artists are, are able to become, you know, creative fonts far in excess of anything that they thought they would be prior. And, and, you know, and despite like grappling with this idea that uh, I'm never going to be able to create again without my, without my drug of choice. Yeah. I mean, my, um, my writing has certainly exploded and, uh, and, you know, I'm so grateful for that. And actually, you know what? This is really funny. This is an interesting thing. I sent out a book proposal recently, which, you know, there was all this hype going into it. And I was like, oh, awesome. I'm going to get a book deal. Didn't happen. Didn't get a single bid on the project. And uh, and it was heartbreaking. And, you know, I went to my kickboxing class and like, you know, beat some people up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then when I was driving back um, and I was like, I'm, I'm still crazy about this. I, what am I going to do now? Like, am I going to go out and run until the sun comes up? Am I, you know, and then the whole next day will be shot. Am I, am I going to go and take a drink? No. And I, you know, I just, I came home and I showered and then there was a song that my, uh, my friend had sent me that he wanted me to write uh, lyrics and do vocals for that. I've been putting off and putting off and putting off because of this writing, because of the book proposal. I finished the song and I recorded it. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
I didn't really think much of it until the next morning. Then I was like, oh, okay. You know, I I got this like, you know, really negative information that, you know, I'm not going to sell a book proposal I had, you know, I was counting on selling. And I was able to convert that into another creative project and like harness that energy for creativity. Right. And, and the, the bigger issue at play really is, is having a healthy relationship with things that you can control and things that you can't. Right. So you have no control over other people's reaction to your work, whether it's a five-star review on Amazon or a one star or whether a big publishing house wants to, you know, buy your book or not. Those are things that are none of your business. You know, the only thing that you have control over is the quality, you know, of the work that you're putting down on paper and putting out there or, you know, putting on, you know, putting on a CD with your music or an MP3. So everything else is, is, you know, they say it in recovery all the time. It's not your business, you know, and like (laughs) detaching from that is where the hard work has to come in. And I, you know, I have friends that do the same thing all the time. They get, they have a, you know, they, they, they become attached to a certain outcome with respect to a project they're working on. It doesn't go that way. And, or you're sitting around waiting, you know, like that you sent your proposal out. Like how long did you wait before they were getting back to you? And that's the worst. And that, and that's like, you know, you have no control, right? Or you're an actor who's auditioned for a part and you're sitting around waiting, you know, knowing that if you get it, your life changes forever. You know, like, yeah. And in those situations, your mind just turns on you. Your mind just starts to consume you. And it's, you know, it's horrible. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a healthy headspace. So, you you know, the only thing you can do is like, Oh, I'll go create, like the only way you can exercise any control over whatsoever you know, over your destiny, you know, being a creative person who makes a living off, you know, things that are coming out of your brain is to just create something new. Yeah. You know, and I said this to a, a stand up comic friend last night, you know, is to that, which is sort of to pursue a life in which you have a creative profession is to become a professional failure. Like you're going to fail more often oh, of course. than you're going to succeed. And you have to be okay with that. The The successes have to be meaningful enough that it's going to sustain you through the failure and that, and, and that you can deal with it, you know, and you know, the, you know, the analogy is, you know, it's like making a baby. Like, only one of those sperms needs to, you know, hit the right. egg. Every and other then, one of them. Fail. Yeah. And you're good. You just got to land one, uh-huh. you know? Right. Um, and, and, you know, and truth be told, you know, 15 years ago, you sent a book proposal out, you don't get a deal. Like, that's it, dude, you're done. But like, you're, you're Mr. Number one Kindle singles guy. You have, you know, you you know, you can own your distribution method. I mean, you have an audience, you know? And so you don't need that gatekeeper to give you the stamp of approval over your work. You still have the ability to, you know, should you choose to publish that, and you know that there are people out there that are interested in hearing what you have to say. Well, and, and you phrase that in the right way. You know, I mean, a lot of it has to do with confidence and self-esteem and stuff like that. Like, do I, do I believe enough in this material to put it out there? Um, you know, and, and, and control and, or, you know, creative control and am I, and, 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 you know, and, and what's driving me, what's motivating me? Why do, why am I doing this? Am I doing it to get a, you know, to get that gold star from a gatekeeper or am I doing it for my man Gerard in, you know, in Portland, who's like hitting the gym every day, changing his diet to like, you know, he's, I think he's, I think he's, he's going to lose another 150 pounds, you know, wow. so I'm, I'm writing for him more than I'm writing for anybody else, man. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I do, you know, this is the thing is that I, I do have faith in editors. Um, I've, I've had the good fortune to work with a couple of editors who have, you know, totally transformed a piece of writing where, you know, at the end of the night, I hate them. I hate myself. I hate writing. I go to sleep, wake up in the morning, look at the piece with fresh eyes. And it's like, not only is this dramatically better than it would have been had I, you know, been left to my own devices. It also reads start to finish like it came from me. 
you know, mm. and and that's and I, I, that I think is a sign of a good editor who can who can make a writer more of what they are, you know. Mm. So I, I, you know, this proposal went out to like, you know, twenty of the top editors in New York, and if nobody bid on it, I think that's a good indicator that there's problems with it. Um, does that mean that I'm going to go back to them? Who knows? Right. You know, the, the I mean, the, the publishing well, landscape he, is changing so much that, oh, I, you know, know I, I just so I have other much. options now. You do. Yeah. It's not the end of the story. And, yeah. you know, I think that's a healthy that's a healthy perspective, though, because, you know, you could be like, you know, your anger could flare. Up. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't you know who I am and all this kind of thing and not be able to hear like, well, 20 for 20, like maybe there is something here. And, and like, OK, I'll objectively go through this again and see you know, where it's missing a beat or, you know, where I can dial it in and, and, you know, turn it into maybe something that is, you know, has the mass appeal that would interest that kind of house. Or you can just say, no, I'm, I'm going to be true to who I am and I believe in this and you can put it out and your audience will respond. Yeah. You know, you hold the cards. They don't hold all the cards. That's, that's one of the, it's funny. That's one of the things that I really learned about, um, getting sober, being sober, continuing to be sober is that, um, man, perhaps this is just being a teenager for 20 years, or this is, you know, sort of back to alcoholic behavior. But I found that like, I was like a biplane, you know, I had two speeds, a hundred percent and zero, Mm -hmm. you know? So if, um, if I like you, then I love you. And like, we're going to be best friends forever. And if, if you, if you annoy me, then I hate you and, and I'm going to kill you, you know? And when, so when I got, you know, you know, sort of critical feedback from these editors, I was finally able to have a nuanced response and to say, you know, I, I think some of what you're saying is true that I do think that, that, you know, the narrative may be hard for people to follow at a certain point. And if it was told, you know, from, from point A to point B, um, it would be easier for readers to grasp. And, um, but, but also, um, I, I think that you're missing something where you see me as purely a, a digital phenomenon. You know, it's not a, um, my, my sales online have not been sales of like an app or a game or something. Right. I've been selling my writing, <laughs> you know, it's people have been consuming it, it, you know, digitally. Why, but, do you, well, what I'm hearing is you're feeling like the publishing houses are dismissive of, you know, Kindle singles sales or you're, you're sort of this, you know, niche performer or I mean, yeah, that's I, like that, that, like oh, those little Kindle single things over there. That's not real writing, or exactly that you know that kind of thing. You know that the the, uh, the paper world and the digital world will never uh, you know will never meet. Well, that's that's um, about as I mean, you know, for them to have that perspective is sowing the seeds of their own destruction. I mean, that's as I, myopic as it gets. I totally agree, and that's the, that's the same logic we saw the music industry use fifteen years ago, and that's mm-hmm. why a lot of those guys are now like selling collectible figurines on eBay instead of working in the music industry. You know, I mean, the the future is here, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. this is, this is real and sort of, and get on, you know, evolve or die. Yeah. And you know, I don't know if you're doing this or not, but you know, on your website, on your blog, like you should, you know, give people the ability to subscribe to your site and collect those emails and, and, uh, you know, cultivate your audience so that you, you know, you can directly (laughs) serve them with your writing, you know, and it doesn't have to be a million people, you know, Mm. it's just people that enjoy what you have to offer and, uh, and, you know, that can grow organically and not in any kind of pitchy sales way, just, you know, people who gravitate to to what you have to offer and, and you become self-sustaining in that way. Yeah. You know, and, and, that's what appeals to me is not, um, you know, not a, a white Mercedes Benz, you know, mm. but just to, I, I would be grateful for the opportunity. Why, to, why white? <laughs> that just seemed to me like <laughs> the most ridiculous thing ever. <laughs> With the bejeweled uh, license plate holder. Yeah, on it. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, driving a nice car in New York is, is just the height of 
stupidity anyway. But I mean, if, if you live in LA, you know, like how, how quickly a white a, car gets there's filthy. A lot, there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of white Mercedes and, you know, you know but yeah. And, and, and that's not what I want, man. I just, I want to, I want sustainability. That, and that was the thing. Drinking was not sustainable. I could not continue that. And I could just could not continue the level I was at. And, and to take every drink that was offered to me or that was bought for me, you know, would be my end. And, um, so I, I, you know, with my writing now, my goal is just to create something sustainable. I want to, I want to, I want to be able to support myself from my writing and I want to always have an audience, Mm -hmm. you know, and that, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you have that and you can continue to have that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got to shift gears a little bit because we're like an hour and a half in here. We haven't even talked about running. <laughs> it's like, I thought this was a health podcast. Like, what are you guys talking about? I'm interested in, you know, I've had a bunch of runners on the show, uh, you know, and I think what I'm interested in with you is this sort of unique relationship between addiction, recovery, and running. Like, what is it? What is it inside of you? Or what do you think that it is that's that's common, you know, with the kind of sober alcoholic that, seems to gravitate towards long distance running, whether it's marathoning or, or ultra running, because you go to these ultra rates, there's tons of sober people. Oh yeah. I mean, (laughs) yeah. So, and they tend to have a lot of tattoos, you know, it's like (laughs) there's an extreme nature to the personality that like, you know, it's like a moth to the flame. Yeah. So what, what do you, you know, how would you, what do you think that's about? I mean, I have my ideas about that, but you know, I get the question all the time, like, Oh, you've just transferred your addiction. You know, I I, I was going to bring that up because I talk about that. Okay. Yeah. I, I get slammed with that all the time. I'm sure you, I bet you get it far more than I do. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is the thing (laughs) for me, taking a drink was always easy piece of cake. The easiest thing in the world even now I have to like goad myself into getting my ass up off the couch and getting out the door. And it's, it's still day in and day out. It's hard for me to force myself to go and kickbox with my buddies or to like sign up for a big run and like, um, and to do the training and stuff like that. That points to me that it's not an addiction because I, I never had to goad myself into taking a drink, man. <laughs> mm-hmm. But there is a reward system kind of embedded in, you know, like when you finish a long run or you kind of, you know, you get that runner's high or there, you know, there's something about it that is alluring. Yeah. I mean, th- there is, it. there is a reward system. This is the thing though, is that you can never get away from that reward system. That's how we're biologically programmed. We're, we're, we're programmed to feel, uh, to feel pain or to feel fear when, you know, when we're cold or when it, w- it's dark and we're in a dangerous situation and stuff like that. And we're programmed to feel pleasure when we, when we get sex, when we get shelter, when we get food, when we get fe- uh, when we get water, you know, when we get the things that we need to survive. So we're, we're never going to be able to escape that, you know, pleasure pain thing. Um, and you know, my, my counter to, to, you know, it's like, I, I, go nuts about the the runner's high thing because for me it's it the nomenclature is or the lexicon is important um when i get high i wake up in the street man (laughs) (laughs) when i get high i wake up at 7 p.m the next day you know when i get high (sighs) horrible things happen right and when I, my sister has two dogs, two stinky dogs. That like every time I see them, they slobber all over me. Like I'm, I'm not even a human being to them. I'm just a dog on two legs. Her dog karma. Um, when I pat her on the head or when I like scratch her ears, I feel pleasure. That's not dog patters high. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's life. Mm-hmm. That's just me hanging out with the dogs, you know? And yes, there is a, chemical reaction that you get you know the release of endorphins and and whatnot but i don't run to get high man i run to live and it's a way for me of confronting my problems and a a way a way for me to confront something that's difficult in my life something that's that scares me i mean the you know the last the last 10 miles whatever race you're doing you're just like i hate this i'm never running again you know Mm -hmm. you're really you're just gutting it out and um 
running for me is a way to embrace life and to to say, yeah, I care. I finally, I care. I care about my life. I care about my friends. I care about my family. I want to be here. Mm-hmm. You know, that's beautifully put, and that's that's put in it in a in a way that I hadn't heard it before because I you know I entertain the question a lot, and I've I've heard other people answer the question, and you know I usually say, and I believe this that it allows me to access a better version of myself for whatever reason. I don't know why, you know, I don't know why I'm attracted to it. I don't know why I have a certain aptitude for it. Um, but I know that when I am engaged in it, that I am a better person <laughs> than when I'm not doing it. Yeah. I mean, I, just not knowing you personally, but just knowing you from reading your book. I mean, what I see is, self-actualization you know i think you went from you know unfulfilled potential to extremely fulfilled potential you know Mm -hmm. you know to verging on superhuman you know and 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 i think we've seen you know a similar thing you know with me from getting sober starting to run and then watching my writing take off, man. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just been like the last they're couple not, of years. Yeah, they're not disconnected. Exactly. You know, and, and that's that's the thing is that, um, you know, writing, writing, running, living sober, you know, all those things, they, they, they feed off each other and they play off of each other. And like, if, um, you know, if I'm addicted to running, then I'm also addicted to being sober. And that's an addiction I can live with. Right. <laughs> Right, 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 right. You know, the other thing is, Rich, not for nothing, you know, like, you you and I are, like, pretty, you know, intensely self-evaluating people. We we, we try to look at ourselves um, with no filter and make hard evaluations. Um, you know, a lot of the people who are telling me that I'm addicted to running are, like, 40 pounds overweight. Mm-hmm. Or they got a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other while they're telling me how addict how I'm gonna destroy my knees. Right. You know, and it's like the big ruddy faced dude who's telling me that like I'm you know, I'm I'm not getting enough protein eating the way that I'm eating or whatever. I'm looking at him going, dude, look in the mirror. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know <laughs> got you know, this there's a lot of people in this country that would benefit from not getting enough protein and not getting <laughs> enough food, not getting enough calories, being addicted to running. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like this nation has an obesity problem, you know, like there's no question about if, that. If only more of us were addicted to running. Yeah. I interviewed this guy the other day on the show, <clears throat> Michael Arnstein, who's an incredible runner. Oh yeah. He's I know him. I've, know, I've run with him. Have you run with times. him? Guy's yeah. amazing. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And he is bouncing off the walls with energy. This yeah. Guy. And all he eats is fruit, raw fruit. It's, and he's like, I mean, he evangelizes this, you know, and he said when he's training really hard, super hard, like he's eating upwards of 30 pounds of fruit a day. Right. Like it's, it's intense. That's man. a lot of time on the can. Man. And I'm like, I can't have an opinion negative or positive on it because I'm not him. I haven't experienced what he's experienced. I can't make, you know, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't judge him and I can't judge something that I don't have any direct experience with. And he looks, you know, he went from 242 to 228. Right? And I mean, it's like he, goes, he ran a 228 marathon eating fruit. You know, it's like who's going to tell him that what he's doing is wrong? He's been doing it for years. He looks fantastic. The, the proof is in the pudding. You know what I mean? So, like that's and this is the thing, too, is that I, you know, I feel the same way about um it's about sort of like ultra eating, like how you eat when you race and how you eat to prepare for your race. I feel the same way about that, that I feel about, you know, sobriety, um, whatever works, man, if it works for mm-hmm. you, like Godspeed, you know, I, I know, I, I know from my own, you know, sort of making, making a laboratory out of races and stuff like that. Uh, you know, if I eat a handful of M&Ms and stuff like that while I'm running, I'll feel great for a minute and then I crash right? and then I fall apart. And if I eat like bananas and potatoes and stuff like that, you know, foods that are easily digested, but that, um, uh, but that don't have that, you know, the insulin spike, right. um, 
I don't feel as good right away, but I feel a lot better at the end of the yeah, day. You're not going to get a super high boost, but you're going to get a more sustained yeah. energy, you know, infusion over time. Yeah. I mean, also I'll, I'll tell you, I like, I'm the like protein guy, you know, I, mm-hmm. I, that's my mom always, you know, you know, you gotta have protein with every meal. That's what you need, you know? And, uh, well, she's up. the expert. Right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, don't mess with mom. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And for the last couple of days, I've been trying to do your, uh, trying to do your Uh powered thing. Yeah. How's it going? I feel pretty good, man. You do? All right. I I um, was prepared for you to tell me you feel horrible. (laughs) Well, dumping caffeine and sugar is a hell that I would, I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm starting to straighten out. And, uh, I, I did, um, I did have a couple of eggs the other day because I just felt like beat up from the weekend. Right. Um, and, I, and, and also, I mean, you know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, that you make a great point about in your book is, is you can sort of like narrow the aperture, you know, just, mm-hmm. just, okay, just cut out Jack in the box to start, right. you know, and then get it to, you know, and then you can sort of, you know, keep, you know, tuning it up and improving it and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I know f- for me, like I had to go all in immediately, just like going to rehab or something like that. That's what works for me, but that's not what works for most people. It might work for you though. You I know? was just going to say, <laughs> I was just going to say, Rich, come on, look who you're talking to. But you, I know, think, you know, I'm the all in yeah, kind of know, guy. Exactly. Too. Uh, but I, well, and it's sort of like, okay, you're, you're off caffeine, you're off sugar, you're detoxing. It's like, well, you know, you know what a detox feels like, you know how to weather a detox. That's familiar territory. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I was going to, I was like, yeah. so there's, there's, there's kind of like a comfort in that for you because you know, you know, you know that it will change and that it will, and then you'll be able to come out the other side of that. Yeah. You for, ex- for, for many yeah. years, I was in the business of feeling bad. <laughs> <laughs> Something I do well. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's like, oh, I, I know what this is all about. The, but, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see the, um, you know, the same thing that, that you've talked about and that I've, I've noticed a lot in my life with, um, you know, with alcohol and stuff, just sort of feeling bloated and feeling slow and, you know, low energy and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And, um, when I'm sort of grazing throughout the day and eating a lot of, uh, you know, I've just been eating a ton of fruits and vegetables. Mm-hmm. My energy is much more consistent throughout right. the day. It's a balanced energy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't have to like, wait uh, like right food 40, coma yeah i don't have to write 45 minutes into my schedule to recover from breakfast mm-hmm. yeah and that in and of itself is huge yeah, yeah. i mean it's, i mean yeah for guys like us to have like a little more time in the day mm-hmm. it's massive you right know? and you know get to your point about you know closing the aperture it's you know i think that part of the problem oftentimes you know if you suggest to somebody oh try a vegan diet or you know plant-based diet it's sort of like well they'll do it for a couple days or a week or however long it is before they slip and and misstep and and then they just say well that was way too hard like i couldn't even make it a week you know forget that as opposed to you know i would i would submit that a healthier reaction to that would be like okay well i'm a human being you know it's like yeah i bet i've been eating that food x for you know 30 years like you know it's no surprise that i suddenly craved it you know yeah so let's just all right let's adjust and you know make the next right choice and move forward and and the more that i kind of just root it in the day like don't worry about what you're gonna eat tomorrow just like what are you eating right now like just just focus on that like make it try to make a better choice about that it doesn't have to be perfect you know progress not perfection like all these sort of recovery tools that i think are so applicable yeah to, you know how we you know develop our habits around food yeah yeah no it's it's totally true i mean i um you know i remember being a kid and being like okay you know not ninth i'm, I'm in ninth grade now nobody's gonna pick on me anymore like i'm gonna do you know 50 push-ups every day and i would do 50 push-ups the first mm-hmm. day and then i'd do like 40 the second day and then the third day i wouldn't do any and then i'd be like oh i give up i hate myself why do i suck so much mm-hmm. And what you got to do is instead of saying, I'm going to do 50 push-ups every day, say, I'm going to, I'm going to do 25 push-ups five days a week, and then I'm going to st- start to ramp it up. And then when you miss a day, get back on the horse, man. Right. You know, just say, oh, all right, I screwed up. Okay, back to it. 
back mm-hmm. to it, back to it, back to it. And that's the thing is if you just, you only fail when you give up, right? If you, if you get, it's, it's only when you get knocked down and you stay down, that's when you lose. You keep mm-hmm. getting back up. You keep getting back up. You know? Well, and it, I think it's about the stories we tell ourselves, like these narratives that we create in our minds about things that are going on that aren't necessarily the truth. You know, so it's sort of like, all right, you missed up, you fell. And then what's the narrative? The narrative is, oh, I'm a piece of shit. I can't do this. I'm terrible. You know, everybody told me I wasn't going to be able to do it. And then you create this self-fulfilling prophecy around that. Yeah. Whereas you actually have, con- you have control over that narrative. You know, you can choose to, you know, create a, a new narrative around it, which is, wow, that's so interesting that I did that. Like, hmm, that's cool. Well, I can file that away for next time. And, you know, now I, I kind of know how that happened. And I, I, I know how to avoid that. Like, you know, giddy up. Yeah. You know, and I mean, the other thing too is like, I, I've been doing a lot of uh, boxing and kickboxing lately. And, uh, you know, I've been punched once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh but you know to to get back in there um and you know to go into spar with somebody and know that you know oh man i'm probably gonna get punched in the face the last time i got punched in the face was like well, that bar fight where i fought those six dudes and like that didn't end well you know so you go into it like sort of dreading it you know and then you get punched in the face and it's like oh i'm still here mm-hmm <laughs> All right. Well, now, you know, now that I know that this thing that terrified me so much didn't destroy me, now we can get down a bit. Right. All right. Now we're talking. Yeah. You know, it's now just we can information. Move it's yeah. information. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah. I got a lot of information this weekend, man. <laughs> <You> do, <yeah. laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about your, uh, your run tomorrow. Your, uh, so this, you, you threw this, uh, this post up on CNN. Um, you know, let's talk about Boston a little bit. Which my plan was I was going to start talking about that because it feels weird. Yeah, I can't talk about anything other than Boston right now. I kind of can't believe we didn't start with that, and I'm and I'm also glad that we didn't. Right. Um, Well, because once you get into it, it's kind of hard to shift gears, and then you feel weird for like, okay, well, enough of that. You know, like let's talk about. Yeah. Um. You know, I in like on Monday I was just in shock, like just you know as I think we all were. Just really, you know, couldn't believe it. Um, you know, I've been through a bunch of crap. You know, there were, like you know, I went through a school shooting when I was 15 at my school. Oh, I was really? In, wow. I was I was in New York for 9-11. I got shipwrecked. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm no stranger to that stuff. For some reason, Boston really shook me, man. I know. I should. This is the point where I should jump in and go, wait, what? You were shipwrecked? But, you know. <laughs> I already know the story, so yeah. and we've been going on for a long time. I know, I know, I know. But uh, if you want to hear more about uh, Mishka's shipwreck story, it's another Kindle single. Yeah, you thank, right thank you yeah. for the plug. <laughs> um, but um, and then where, where were you uh, on nine eleven? Um, I was hungover, man. I was asleep, mm-hmm. and uh, and my girlfriend's roommate woke me up, and she was like, "Mishka, you got to wake up. You got to they." They just attacked the World Trade Center. And I was like, what? And, you know, I just sort of walked out of bed and, and watched on TV as the second tower fell. And it was just like, you know, um, sort of like our jaws dropped and we have yet to pick them back up. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, just blew my mind. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is the thing, though, man. Like post 9-11 New York, awesome place to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, uh, I remember being in the subway, um, you know, years after nine 11 and, uh, this girl, you know, I think iPods are like the, the new generation of iPods had just come out and, you know, this girl dropped her iPod and it bounced on the platform and then fell into the tracks. She was like, Oh man, I just got that. And, uh, there was a train coming and her boyfriend sort of was sort of like looking around And he looked at me and I was like, I was like, I'll pull you up. And he jumped right in, grabbed the iPod, threw the iPod, reached up to me. I grabbed his hands, pulled him up. The train came in. We got on the board, you know, on the train, you know, and it was just like, we're in this together, man. You know, like Mm -hmm. all of us, we're in this together, right? There's something, we've got a problem here. We've got to fix it. I need your help. I'm in. Let's do it. Done. Mm -hmm. You know, I never got their names. They never got my name. You know, 
I hope they do the same. Um, but um, the thing that was so heartbreaking about Boston is that, you know, and, and, and this is what I wrote, you know, about for CNN is that it's, you know, it's like an inversion of Newtown. And, and, and that was so horrifying to us because here's someone who's attacking human beings with infinite potential before them. Those children could have grown up to be anyone. We'll never know the contributions that they could have made. To And Boston is... It's the elites. The best the best marathoners in the world mm -hmm. there to compete. And, you know, the, the globe is represented there. It's not a, it's not an Amer it's not a Northeast thing. It's not an American thing. It's not a North American thing. Everybody's there, man. And if you're, you know, and as a Bostonian, uh, you know, it's the marathon is, you know, it's a pastime. It is emblematic of the city. Yeah. It's a, it's a huge cultural event. And, um, that's the thing, man, no matter how, no matter how gifted you are, or what shape you're in, you have to really try to run a marathon, any marathon, and you have to really try to get into Boston to qualify for Boston. So these are people who are ambitiously striving to, to be the best that they can to, to excel at something, to, to do something incredible, to, to live beyond the ordinary and to strike at that. It seemed it seemed to me as just I mean that's terror right there like like if you we will not allow you to dream you will not be allowed to be ambitious you you can't can't think about doing something incredible because we'll kill you and to which my response is fuck you <laughs> mm -hmm. and. uh you know, I just, I got mad about, you know, Tuesday, it made me cry. And then, you know, and then finally yesterday, I just, I got mad about it. And I was like, no, this, this will not stand. You know, um, you want to destroy this race and, and, and you want to destroy it in an ironic manner in which the projectile caused the people who survived to have their legs amputated. Mm -hmm. So they'll never run again. Well, we're going we're gonna to respond to your irony with a, another irony, which is that Boston this year will be bigger and better and more memorable and more meaningful than ever because it's going to be like a pandemic. It's just going to be runners who care about themselves and who care about other people and who care about competition and humanity and ambition and dreams. We're going to go out together and we're going to go out alone <laughs> to show you that you didn't win, man, and that you never will. I think we got to end there, man, because you just, <laughs> you, you nailed it. That was beautiful. So mad about it, man. I'm so, like, right. so angry about Boston. I wish we could use the podcast to get people to who, who are going to listen to come out and run with you, but it's tomorrow. I don't think I'm going to get the podcast up until well, tomorrow it's, night. I, 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 um, I'm going out Saturday. Saturday. Oh, tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow's, tomorrow's Friday. Friday. Yeah. I'll try to get this up Friday night and I'll, uh, and also I'll uh, tweet and post it. See. I mean, this is the thing too, man. If is people want to run with you, what, what, how should they, uh, how should they get in touch with you? Um, write to me on Facebook, email me. I mean, if, if you want to get in touch with me, you'll find a way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'll respond and we'll meet up and we'll run together. And, and, and if everybody, and if tons of people want to do it, then awesome. Then tons of us will do it. And if nobody wants to do it, I'll do it on my own, man, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and it won't be any less meaningful for that, you know? Right. Cool, man. Well, if people do want to find Mishka, he's on Twitter at, at Mishka Shubali, S H U B A L Y. That's and it. The, and the website's Mishka Shibali. Yeah, the website is just uh, Mishka Shibali. It's M I S H K A S H U B A L Y. And same on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. Yes. I'm, I'm <laughs> right, <dude>. ubiquitous. <laughs> all right. And uh, you can pick up the long run and shipwrecked. And then you have another you have another single up there too, right? Uh, What's the other I have one? Uh, Bachelor Number uh, One, which was right. about uh, my misadventures with reality TV. 
And uh, are you lonesome tonight about a particularly committed stalker that I have? Right. We, you're going to have to come back on the show because I want to hear more <laughs> about that. <laughs> Is there anything else coming up? Is your band plan? In town? Um, I am working on my next Kindle single. Which oh, is, you are good. Uh, which is about being old and still needing to rock. Yeah, nice. <laughs> have you uh, have you seen uh, Anvil? The story of Anvil. Oh the my documentary? god! That that talk about a triumph of <laughs> a triumph. I mean, those guys should have given up, and they didn't, and they succeeded. Mm-hmm. And you know, it's amazing. That, yeah. that guy lips like I don't think I've ever rooted for anybody more in my life than no, I have for that. It's guy. an he's, amazing. He cares for, so much. He's so positive. Yeah, for for the listeners out there, uh, there's a documentary called Anvil: The Story of Anvil, and it's the story of a heavy metal band that uh, was sort of poised for greatness very early on, and and uh, made a few left hand turns when they should have turned right, and ended up not making it, and yet they uh, they held firm to their 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 dream and. Um, and uh, continue to, you know, rock it out and record albums every year, even though, you know, they had a tiny following in Toronto and it never made it big. And it's it, even if you hate heavy metal, have no interest in it whatsoever, it's a beautiful story about the human spirit and what, you know, what happens when you refuse to give up and you hold true to your dream. Yeah, it's, I, I, I never thought a heavy metal documentary would be so mean. Yeah, <laughs> it's a sweet movie. It is. So. Yeah, cool. All right, we got to get out before Garage Man explodes. On us, I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, man. That was awesome. Rich, we went such deep. a pleasure. We, man. we went deep, dude. Yeah, you feel all right? Yeah, I. Uh, I'm. I, yeah, I feel a little beat dude. up. I may have to eat some eggs, but I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> you feel beat up? Come on. It was like that was intense, dude. You asked some tough questions. Well, you know that's where the gold is. You got to dig for it a little bit, right? Fair enough. All right, man. Thanks for being a good sport. Thanks a lot for having me, man. All right. Peace. Plants. Yeah.